Good evening and welcome to Poland Daily. I'm Konrad Gorlinski. The former Polish Prime Minister and former President of the European Council, Donald Tusk's return to Polish politics has led to a power struggle for the reins of the largest opposition party, Civic Platform. Donald Tusk currently holds the top spot, but parts of the party ranks are becoming increasingly public about their wish for last year's runner-up in the presidential election, Warsaw Mayor Rafał Trzaskowski, to lead Civic Platform for the parliamentary elections in 2023. Interviewed by Super Express, Civic Platform Senator Antoni Mężydło candidly stated that if there is no Tusk effect by the end of the year, Rafał Trzaskowski should take over the reins of Civic Platform. He added that the party only has a chance to win the next election with Chaskovsky at its helm. Rafał Chaskovsky's main character traits are ambition, high aspirations and self-confidence. I believe that he thinks, based on his result in last year's presidential election, that he is Civic Platform's most popular politician. After Donald Tusk's return to Polish politics, the former head of the party, Boris Budka, became the new head of the party's parliamentary caucus, which caused Cezary Tomczyk, a close associate of Rafał Czeskowski, to lose that position. Mr. Tusk returned to Polish politics and decided to build his position with the help of Boris Budka. We know that before his return, there was no unity between the party leaders of the civic platform, and there was even a very clear rivalry between Mr. Budka and Mr. Czeskowski. Additionally, experts say that it's becoming clear that Donald Tusk is trying to weaken Czeskowski's position in the party by sidelining his close associates. Donald Tusk is formerly the vice chairman of the platform but serves as its acting chairman. This temporary solution may last at least until the parliamentary elections. Thousands of Hungarians participated in the annual Budapest Pride March on Saturday to voice their support for the country's LGBTQ community. The Hungarians were also joined by a large group of foreign diplomats, NGOs and representatives of the corporate world in their protest against a law that limits the propagation of homosexuality and sex change surgeries to children. Hungary's conservative prime minister, Viktor Orban, in power since 2010, has introduced social policies that he says aim to safeguard traditional Christian values from Western liberalism, stoking tensions with the European Union. The European Commission has launched legal action against Orban's government over the new law, which came into force this month, saying it is discriminatory and contravenes European values of tolerance and individual freedom. One of the many Western politicians attending the march was German MEP Terry Reintke. On this day, we stuck here together and we fought. We fought for our right, we fought for democracy, we fought for rule of law, we fought for our freedom, and we fought for dignity. So let us take this day, let us all take this day and make it the most memorable, the most beautiful, the most colorful, and the most powerful day of all days. Let us walk the street of Budapest today with our head up high and celebrate our lives, celebrate who we are, and celebrate who we love. Happy Pride, Budapest! Organizers said in a statement that the rally would show opposition to power-hungry politicians and reject intimidation of LGBTQ people. More than 40 embassies and foreign cultural institutions in Hungary issued a statement backing the Budapest Pride Festival. And China's large rural migrant population has been particularly hard hit by the largest flooding seen in years in the city of Zhengzhou. The water masses in the Henan province have now claimed dozens of lives and yet unknown amounts of damage. For many migrant workers caught up in the severe flooding in the central Chinese city of Shengzhou, crossing town to stay with relatives in less affected areas or returning to their homes in the countryside just isn't possible. They must stay put, tied to livelihoods in inundated parts of the city and living too far away from their families to reach them when transportation is so badly disrupted. I would never have thought that my home would be completely destroyed. All of my belongings were, were damaged by the water, and most of them are furniture, including television and so on. The death toll in Henan province, where Zhengzhou is located, is 56, and five people are missing, according to state media. Lu Jingjiang's family-run business 
Prince was hit by the flood, hailing from a city over 100 kilometers from Zhengzhou. She had opened a noodle restaurant just before the floods hit, investing her life savings of $31,000 in the business. I always hoped that the rain wouldn't be this heavy. I think no matter how heavy the rain is, even if the drainage in Zhengzhou is so bad, there wouldn't be so much water accumulation. If the loss is only a few thousand dollars, then forget it. But it was the first time that we started a business and the loss was so great. We have only one person working in the family and we have invested all of our money in this restaurant. China's estimated 280 million rural migrant workers often flock to cities like Zhengzhou in search of better jobs leaving behind families and only returning home once a year for the Lunar New Year. The city of 12 million was hit by torrential rain equivalent to a year's worth in just a few days. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on Saturday weighed in on the situation in Afghanistan, saying the Afghan leadership are consolidating their forces around the key population centers. The U.S. is closely following the Taliban's advance, which comes ahead of the final withdrawal of U.S. troops from the country by the end of August. Taliban insurgents control about half of Afghanistan's district centers, a senior U.S. general said on Wednesday, indicating a rapidly deteriorating security situation. The defense secretary stated that the Afghan government needs to slow the Taliban's advance. You've correctly uh, described what the Afghan leadership is doing right now. They are consolidating their, their forces around uh, the key population centers. In, in terms of whether or not uh, it will uh, stop the Taliban, I think the first thing to do is to make sure that uh, they can uh, s slow the momentum uh, and, then, and then be able to put themselves in a position where they can retake some of the gains uh, that the Taliban, uh, some of the uh, ground that they've lost. So I, I think, uh, I think from my engagements with the Afghan leadership, they are committed to that. And, uh, and so uh, we look forward to, uh, to them making progress. They have, they have the capabilities, they have the capacity to, to, uh, to make progress and, and to, and to really begin to blunt some of the uh, Taliban's uh, advances, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. So. Insecurity has been growing in Afghanistan in recent weeks, largely spurred by fighting in its provinces as U.S.-led foreign troops complete their withdrawal and the Taliban launch major offensives, taking districts and border crossings. The formal end to the U.S. military mission in Afghanistan has been set for August 31st. And thank you for tuning in this evening. I hope you have a great week ahead.